in spite of the fact that we're, um, our industry is built largely for bulk handling, at least in wheat and canola and barley, maybe not so much pulses because it's more containerized shipping. But I think there's going to be more specialization and segmented markets. Um, and that will be an opportunity. Uh, consumers want more choice and um, we just have to find a way to, to satisfy that. Um, it's, it's not going to be good enough to just ship wheat in 100 and 150 car trains. Um, we, we do have to find a way to uh, segment those products. Hello, and welcome to the first episode of the Grain Growers of Canada podcast, Beers with Brandon. I'm your host for this special summer series podcast, Brandon Leslie. Many of you will be familiar with our main podcast, Fireside Chats with Aaron, hosted by Grain Growers Executive Director, Aaron Gowerlich. After 20 fantastic episodes, Aaron has decided to step away from the podcast for this summer, and I've stepped in for a slightly different format that I hope you'll enjoy. For those of you wondering who the hell I am, here's the Coles Notes. Since late January 2020, I have been working as the Manager of Policy and Government Relations for the Grain Growers of Canada, based out of Ottawa. And frankly, it's the perfect job for me. I grew up on a farm just south of Portage of Prairie, Manitoba, where my parents still farm, growing mostly wheat and soybeans for seed currently, but have dabbled a number of crop rotations over the years. Growing up, I will admit that farming didn't seem like it was for me. I think my dad figured that out pretty early too. When I was about 12, I would routinely throw my golf clubs on my back, hop on my bike, bike three quarters of a mile past the farmyard from our house, just to hop a fence and play golf at the local nine hole course. While I am happy to be a pretty decent golfer, that didn't help me learn to weld, fix equipment, or any of the other myriad of tasks farmers are required to undertake as part of a successful operation. As an only child, it would be reasonable to think my parents would have pressured me to take over the farm. But my parents never tried to force me to do anything, and were always incredibly supportive of whatever I wanted to do, even when I had absolutely no idea what that was. I highly doubt that they thought I would end up lobbying for farmers in Ottawa, nor hosting an agricultural podcast, but yet, here we are. After high school, I spent a couple of years at Brandon University when I decided to apply to an internship with a member of parliament in Ottawa for the summer of 2010. I really wasn't even all that knowledgeable about politics at the time, but that opportunity led to 10 years working directly in politics. After that summer, I transferred to Carleton University to finish up my degree while working part-time for an incredibly cool member of parliament, Lori Hahn. Lori was the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of National Defense at that time and later was a member of the government's Deficit Reduction Cabinet Committee. This was his second career after serving over 30 years as a fighter jet pilot in the Canadian Air Force. Lori is a heck of an interesting man and taught me so much in my early career, and, for, and I will forever be grateful. In 2013, Lori announced that he wouldn't be running again in 2015, so I decided to make a move. I went to work for the Minister of Public Safety, which is a massive department that oversees the RCMP, Corrections Canada, CSIS, and the CBSA. This was another fantastic opportunity where I was able to learn a tremendous amount about Canada's security infrastructure, our firearms laws, border issues, and our correction system, and really broaden my understanding of how government functions from both the ministerial and departmental side. It was the 2015 election when my attention began to return to my farm roots. With all my family and many close friends back in Manitoba, I would come home as often as possible and always kept a close connection. It was that 2015 election, though, when I spent 72 straight days with MP Larry McGuire, touring around southwestern Manitoba, hearing old stories from farm politics back in the day, that I remembered just how much I cared about my home, where I'm from, and agriculture. In 2016, I started working for Manitoba Member of Parliament Robert Sopak, and that desire to stand up for Canadian farmers and the rural communities that they support really took hold for me. Robert, or Bob Sopak, is colloquially known as the right-wing environmentalist and is one of the most ardent defenders of the rural way of life to have ever stepped foot in Parliament. Bob is a huge mentor of mine, teaching me much about political communication, rural issues, and how to get things done in Ottawa. We will be having him on as a guest soon, and you can see that for yourself. After he announced he would not be running in 2019, I decided that nearly 10 years in politics was enough, and it was time to step back from direct politics and try to focus on working for the agricultural sector in some way. After taking on the role of campaign manager for Candace Bergen back in my home riding of Port of Zizgar, followed by helping MP Dan Mazur for a few months, the MP who took over from Bob's riding, the opportunity I was looking for came along, and it's been a pleasure representing farmers in Ottawa ever since. So here we are. 
a farm kid from Manitoba, managed to walk around the halls of power for nearly a decade, learn a heck of a lot, and now apply what I learned about government to try to get those things done for farmers. It's an uphill battle, but it's a fight we need to have. But that's enough about me, as our guests are far more interesting than I am. When planning for this podcast, I decided that it should reflect who I am a bit, though, and what, I, what, what we wanted to accomplish. So the goal of this podcast is to bring on interesting people from in or connected to the agricultural industry. Names you'll probably recognize, but people you may not know. Just like many of you, I enjoy speaking with interesting people, learning a bit about them, talking egg, tasting beers, and sharing a few laughs. And that's just what we're going to do. Across Canada, there's an important relationship between farmers, brewers, and maltsters. We have seen a surge in breweries popping up across this country, and we want to help highlight that relationship. As such, we found the perfect partner for this summer series and our presenting sponsor, Beer Canada. Beer Canada is the voice of the people who make our nation's beers, and their members account for 90% of the beer produced in Canada. The sale of beer supports 149,000 Canadian jobs, generates $14 billion in gross domestic product, and $5.7 billion in government tax revenues. Beer Canada has represented brewers since 1943. But now that you've gotten to know me and our sponsor and what to expect, it's time to introduce our first guest. Our inaugural guest for this podcast is a farm leader with a wealth of experience in government, the private sector, and farm politics. He's also well-versed on the growth in the brewing sector and the important relationship between farmers and brewers. And I think he'll be a perfect way to kick off this podcast. Tom Steve is currently the general manager of the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commissions, two producer-directed organizations rep representing the interests of and serving as a single voice for all of Alberta's 17,000 wheat and barley producers. Prior to this role, Tom served as general manager of the Saskatchewan Wheat and Barley Development Commissions, directing the activities of the newly formed organizations. Tom has held senior positions in the grain industry, government, and media. He has worked as a key strategist in numerous mergers and acquisitions, public policy debates, and election campaigns. While working as director of customer relations and service with the agribusiness Viterra, he led programming aimed at driving sales growth and enhanced relationships with farmer customers. Tom began his career as a broadcast journalist before transitioning to the government, where he served as Director of Communications to the Premier of Saskatchewan and the Cabinet Press Secretary. Tom, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to sit down with you, albeit virtually, to help kick things off. So welcome to Beers with Brandon. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. Uh, great to be with you and uh, great to be um, amongst uh, two people that have four first names between them, Brandon <laughs> and Tom and Steve. We're quite, the pair. <laughs> but, uh, We're quite the pair. I, I, I always get, um, my names always get reversed. I get called Steve just about every other day. So uh, you seem okay with it though, eh? I'm good with it. Yeah. So <laughs> pleasure to be with you. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us here. So let's dive in here before we start uh, sampling a couple of the fine beers that we're going to, we're going to get into from village here. So, so we've had the opportunity to meet a couple of times before, and I think it's fair to say we, you know, we kind of quickly bonded due to our shared experience in politics and, and love of agriculture. So you've had quite the, quite the career so far, but can you tell us how you transitioned from radio broadcaster to political staffer to grain industry back to farm politics here? That's quite the progression. Yeah, sounds like I couldn't keep a job. And um, But like you, um, I'm a farm kid. I grew up about a half an hour south of Regina, Saskatchewan, uh, in the Regina Plains. And um, the last thing I wanted to do was uh, stay on the farm. I actually uh, wanted to be a rock and roll musician. And uh, I did that for a while in high school. And then my uh, guidance counselor in grade 12 said, you know, unless you're going to be the second coming of uh, Led Zeppelin or Steppenwolf, maybe you should uh, consider this program at the Lethbridge Community College. It's called Radio Arts. And I had never really considered uh, being in broadcasting, but I, but I was interested in radio. Um, and so I, I went to Lethbridge College and one thing led to another. And I got a job at CFSL Radio in Weyburn in 1975. And one of the first things uh, that I covered was uh, this intense debate over whether or not they should build a farmer-owned inland terminal in Weyburn. And um, at that time, you know, you, you still had uh, elevator, five elevators every seven miles and farmers were used to that system. And a group of farmers in that area came up with this idea uh, of building uh, a high throughput terminal which is still there today. It's operated now by Parrish and Heimbecker and has succeeded over the years. 
uh, but there was this intense political debate. Um, the NDP were involved, the United Church was involved, and so on. And I think that's where I got my first taste of an interest in farm politics. I didn't really come back to it until a few years later, but that was uh, that was a good introduction. Well, it's a heck of a journey. I'm glad he came back, and I know a lot of other people are there. And and, and that includes the the team that that surrounds you. And I'd like you to maybe talk a little bit about some of the team that you have currently with the two commissions. I know it's it's been a lot going on for you guys. And and based on that experience that you've had, you know, what does it take to bring a good team together here? Perhaps a bit of a big picture question, but what what do you look for in this industry to bring a team together that's going to be effective to do this job? Yeah, well, I mean, we ultimately we look for the fit and uh, the teams that I've worked with over the years, whether it was in broadcasting or my career with United Grain Growers or Agricore United, uh, Viterra. Um, we, we always were able to assemble teams of people with a common purpose. And I think that's what we have here at the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commissions. We're, we're not only two commissions, we run a magazine, Grains West, um, and uh, we operate a cash advance program, the farm cash program, uh, which we launched three years ago. And I think it's the looking for people that are really dedicated to a common goal. and um, you know, it, do, it doesn't always happen by design. Uh, I, and, and in fact, I inherited a number of high quality people here when I uh, came to Alberta in 2014, uh, managing the Alberta Wheat Commission, and then eventually Alberta Wheat and Barley. Uh, but it just seems like after a while, it, um, it becomes an infectious uh, um, thing that where people really want to gravitate to an organization that is successful. And I think that's what we've accomplished here. And it's a very diverse group as well. Um, you know, we have uh, 50, 59% of our workforce are, are women and the majority of our managers are women. Um, and we have about 40% uh, of the staff that are from diverse backgrounds, whether that's uh, ethnic, uh, religious, uh, you know, um, you name it. And uh, we're, we're pretty proud of that. Again, not all of it's been done by design. Um, and it and it's partly a function of, in Calgary, we have access to a very broad and diverse uh, group of people. And uh, we've been able to attract some really high quality staff. And I, I get to test that. I get to work with them. And I know they are. But it's interesting you mentioned the, the percentage of women. That's one of the first things when I entered this sector was I noticed that I think I did a meeting and there was there was 10 women and me in a, in a meeting. And, and I, I don't want to say I was surprised, but I was surprised. And then you get to speaking with these people and, and the passion and the intellect and the ability to, to, as you say, kind of a focused, targeted goal is quite impressive. So so kudos to the team you've assembled. And, and, I, and I'm looking forward to the future of generations here because there's a lot of talented folks working in this sector right now, in my view. Yeah. And, it, you know, I, I came from the grain industry, so I worked a number of years um, in that sector and, um, a disproportionate amount of, um, uh, men, um, you know, ele your traditional elevator managers, uh, and, but over time that's, that's evolved as well. I think now we, you know, our, our challenge is to, to broaden that out beyond a, a gender issue and, and, uh, in terms of, uh, more ethnic diversity, um, uh, you know, first nations, um, there, there, we have to be able to attract people to our industry. And I, I think we're having some pretty good success there, but uh, it's, it's still a work in progress. Absolutely. Well, I think now might be a good opportunity here before we get into a few more questions about the brewing industry specifically uh, to take a, a, a bit of a sample here. And perhaps first I'll give a bit of a background here. So I know you know these folks well um, that we're going to be highlighting today because they're right in your own backyard. But today we're going to be sampling a selection of beers from the Calgary-based Village Brewery. Uh, Village has a fairly interesting belief system uh, and origin. And some of the best things happen over beer, they say. Ideas are born, friendships forged, deals struck, and communities built. And that's how Village Brewery began. Friends sharing beers and dreams. Around the table, they had close to a century and a half of brewing experience. One of them was a legendary Canadian brewmaster. Naturally, the talk turned to the arts and craft of better beer, then to the secret sources of malts and hops. 
By last call, the group had dreamed up a true community brewery, one that would support Canadian Calgary's artists and craftspeople, and one that would create the excellent ales that our friends and neighbors deserve. That talk over beer started, started that brewery. It takes a village to raise a beer and a beer to raise a village. Village Brewery sources local and regional products where possible and has found numerous ways to support local growers over the years, including urban farms. Through the Village Gardener Craft Beer, Village has worked with numerous community gardens over the last decade to source products and create a unique annual release of a special brew. Village has also been an innovator, finding partners to work on sustainability initiatives. Kate Dingwall profiled Village's sustainable, sustainable Water Blonde Ale in an article that was published in Forbes magazine, showcasing how breweries around the globe promote sustainability in their operations and product offerings. The Village, the Village Sustainable Water Blonde Ale was a collaboration with the University of Calgary's Advancing Canadian Water Assets and Xylem Inc. to produce a limited release batch of their delicious Village Blonde Ale using wastewater treated through innovation and rigorous clean tech before they brewed it up. Innovation and water reuse will be critical parts to solutions, critical parts of solutions to deal with global water scarcity. And sustainable approaches to brewing can help spur future development that fuel greater innovation. And this was a good start. I think it's a very parallel uh, you know, storytelling that, that must take place amongst these brewers that we're we're seeing a lot of in, in our industry. Um, but Tom, I think we're gonna we're gonna sample a beer if you're ready. Okay. We are going to start with a craft easygoing pale ale now this one i'm not gonna lie might be the first non-alcoholic drink that i've ever tried perhaps i should try them a little more often but i am looking forward to it so tom why don't you go ahead and crack it i'm just gonna read a couple of the tasting notes for this and yep. then we'll get a little bit of your feedback and keep things going here got my official alberta barley uh, oh, wow. mug here so yeah love it so this is the first low alcohol offering from Village, and uh, it was introduced in August 2019 as the Village Local Pale Ale. It was designed to be a pale ale that appeals to everybody. Uh, due to low amount of malt, it is a very light and refreshing mouthfeel and body. The pale ale was rebranded as Craft as Village embarked on a national launch of their non-alcoholic brews across the country in June 2021. Only 15 calories in this can. Now, that's something I should be considering more often. What do you think, Tom? Um, well... It definitely has that uh, IPA flavor. And if, um, you know, if I didn't know better, I would say there is alcohol in it. It, it does taste like an alcoholic beverage. So um, <clears throat> for those that, um, that that pleases their palate, uh, it's, it's very nice. That is. I, I, it's, it's, it's a little lighter than I thought it would be for a little bit of a darker beer. Not too dark, yeah. but it. It's, it is very light and refreshing. Yeah. No, it's, it's very good. I, I've, I've had the odd, um, you know, non-alcoholic beer over the years, and usually they just don't taste like much of anything. And, um, but obviously they've perfected this. Uh, so it's very, very Excellent. good. Yeah. Well, why don't we get back to some questions and perhaps uh, focus a little bit about, um, you know, on the brewing industry. I know you're very passionate about the success of wheat and barley growers across Canada, particularly in Alberta. And I know Alberta wheat and barley has been actively engaged with the brewing community in Alberta. Can you just tell us about some of the work you've been doing in this space and, and where you see the brewing industry in Alberta heading? Um, well, the craft brewing industry has just really exploded. Uh, we work with the uh, uh, Alberta uh, Small Brewers Association. I think there are about 90 different companies now in the industry in Alberta. And I mean, it's not restricted to our province, but I think there is a, a critical mass here because of the <clears throat> access to, to local barley and just uh, a little bit of the mystique around barley production, uh, especially in central Alberta. You know, we've had two major maltsters in, uh, in the province for uh, quite a number of years, Canada malting in Calgary and uh, RAR malting in Alex. And, um, you know, they drive a lot of uh, the industry in terms of uh, special relationships with, uh, with growers. But what's happened in more recent years is that uh, we've seen <clears throat> this explosion in the craft brewing industry. Uh, they're interested in interacting directly with growers. So, you know, companies like uh, um, not just Village, but uh, Toolshed Brewing in, uh, in Calgary, and really uh, Big Rock, 
which was probably uh, the original craft brewer. And they were um, among, if not the first uh, major customer of Rar Malting and Alex. And now uh, you, you would consider Big Rock as uh, more of a mainstream brewing company. Um, but it's it's just uh, taken off, you know, companies like uh, uh, Blind Man, Troubled Monk and Red Deer, um, they're uh, they're growing and uh, their working relationships with the farmers are quite extraordinary. And we've had some um, some farmers that have actually uh, integrated their business into uh, micro malting and brewing. So, for example, um, the Hamel uh, family in the Penhold area, uh, they're farmers uh, and they operate red shed malting. And so they're selling their product to the um, the craft brewing industry. Um, we have the Hilton family out at Strathmore, and they actually have the trifecta. Um, they're farmers, they're maltsters, and they're also brewers. And so uh, they're they're doing uh, the entire value chain. And and they're not the only ones. I just use those as, as examples. Our our uh, vice chair of our board, Wade McAllister. Uh, they're located at Penhold. They have a very close relationship with uh, with uh, some of these uh, companies. And um, I think what's happened is that, uh, you know, uh, McAllister's, for example, have the tool shed uh, brewing uh, logo on the side of their combine. That's the, that's the level of pride that they take in the product that they produce. And I think that's uh, maybe the transformation that's happened in the last few years is... Um, it's become more than a commodity-based uh, venture. It's become uh, a value add. That, that's, that's really interesting. You mentioned that kind of that mystique of, of Durham. So what has this craft beer craze done, I guess, more broadly for Alberta's economy? Because this has been a pretty big boom. And I think we still have some interprovincial trade barriers to knock down so we can get a little more product to some of the yeah. folks that don't live in, in uh, or are unfortunate to live in Alberta. But what has that done from an economic perspective, and and what has that done for, for Durham growers? You mentioned that kind of that pride. Uh, what what's what's the biggest impact on growers? Um, well, I think it's just um, we we've had a few down years in the, the barley sector, and um, but it's there's been a pretty big recovery, and it's not just malting barley because probably seventy five percent or more of barley goes through a cow or a, a pig um, as feed barley, but uh, that market is flourishing and uh, we have a, a big uptick in, in exports into China, both feed and malt. And I think it's uh, given growers uh, a renewed sense of optimism in barley as a cropping option. For a few years, I think that uh, we were losing acres to pulses and canola um, and um, the prices weren't great um, now the prices are pretty good and it's also a crop that uh, that can thrive in uh, less advantageous uh, conditions um, because um, you know with with drought um, and which we're experiencing in Western Canada right now some of the areas where um, where barley thrives in Alberta are a little more um, moisture, um, have a little better moisture profile. <clears throat> and so the, the crops uh, work better, uh, the yields are working good, and they have, a they have a local market and an export market. And that I think that's uh, brought some appeal back to barley as a cropping option, in addition to just that pride of okay, here's a can of craft beer uh, that came from my farm. And uh, we do have our, our logo is on uh, uh, tool shed beer, for example. Uh, we haven't completely um, uh, expanded that uh, idea, but, it, but it's certainly something that uh, the, the, the craft brewers like to be associated with the farmers and vice versa. Well, I think that's, that's exactly why we wanted you to be the first guest, because that is that close relationship that does exist that many folks probably don't know about. But when you hear those interesting stories of, of that level of pride to go out and buy a sticker to throw it in your combine, that's, yeah. that says something in and of itself there. Yeah. So, 
talk maybe to get back to some of your earlier days in politics obviously i'm quite interested in, in kind of the path you took and, and you've had some similar experiences and you heard me mention larry mcguire in my in my intro to this episode here and i know you two are often kind of fighting the same battles uh back in the day so i'm just kind of curious who are some of the folks that you looked up to when you were involved in some pretty heavy farm policy discussions and, and kind of you know what what was what were some of the things you did accomplish over the years that you're you're quite proud of? Well, uh, Larry McGuire would be one. Actually, he was president of the Western Canadian Wheat Growers when I worked there, and uh, the the amount of time and energy that he put into that job was just incredible. And I and you see that now. And I'm congratulate him on his private members bill actually making it through. Um, you know, but uh, that's. Uh, the type of tenacity that uh, that Larry possesses, so good on him. Um, in my career, I mean, I've had a number of influences. With respect to farm politics, I would have to mention Ted Allen. So Ted Allen was the president of United Grain Growers for, and then Agricor United for most of the time that I worked there. <clears throat> Ted is originally from Tabor, a uh, school teacher who. Uh, farmed and uh, he became the president of the company and uh, was never afraid to take on the conventional institutions like the Canadian Wheat Board. Sometimes that cost us rail cars the week after he would appear in the Western Producer or Grain News uh, uh, saying something critical about the single desk. But, but Ted had the, the courage to uh, put his views out there. And by and large, the delegate body of uh, United Grain Growers, where I worked, and I was quite proud to work for them, uh, agreed with him. And, um, you know, I <clears throat> always really appreciate uh, the uh, intestinal fortitude of people that just put their views out there on the line. And, and Ted was right up there. Um, another major influence of mine, of course, was Grant Devine, the Premier of Saskatchewan, who I worked for. And um, his... I actually grew up across the street from his grandmother in a little hamlet called Gray, Saskatchewan. And um, I got to know and work uh, with Grant and I really admired his, uh, his vision. And um, a lot of what he uh, accomplished uh, really wasn't recognized until years later when Brad Wall uh, became the premier of Saskatchewan. And Brad, I worked with Brad as well. Um, but I, I, I still hear from Grant from time to time, and he's still as passionate as ever. Excellent. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned that about Ted. And it's in today's day and age, I'm not sure how uh, much you're allowed to say your opinions anymore, but <laughs> somebody needs, still needs to. I, we need you kicking around still doing that uh, on, on Ted's behalf uh, for, the, for the community here, too. Well, maybe I think it's time we, uh, we try our second beer. We're going to move into some with uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit stronger. Um, a percentage of, uh, of alcohol here. Yeah. Going gonna, right to the high test. It looks like, yeah. Uh, yeah. I ordered them in a, perhaps an interesting manner. Uh, this one will be the, uh, the village blacksmith, the Alberta black ale. Now this is a, 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 a very, I'm very intrigued as to what this one is going to take like here. So why don't you go ahead and I'll read a little bit of the tasting notes here. Will you start that? And then we'll uh, get your feedback here. Okay. So, the Village Blacksmith is one of the brewery's flagship beers, and it is a unique beer creating its own category, the Alberta Black Ale. It is distinctly dark and flavorful ale that carefully balances the sweet flavors of the dark malts with the bitterness of the hopping. Citrus aromas balanced with roasted espresso, chocolate, and licorice. Well, Tom? I'm liking it. Are you? It... Um... It's interesting because it doesn't uh, quite have the the bite of the non-alcoholic IPA. It's uh, it's it's more subtle. I that's a lot lighter than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, for something called the black ale, that's very yeah. good. Yeah, and yes, I believe it is. Oh, it's a five point four percent, so okay, it's not too overly strong. We're getting but... up there, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, going, we're going in the right direction, though. That is a very good beer. And at the end of this, I am going to ask you, and you have to pick, I'm sorry, which of these is your favorite? So, so keep a mental ranking as we go along here. Okay. So, you know, I'm kind of curious for, for a guy like yourself who's had 
a lot of experiences. Um, I'm sure some, some, a lot of battles and through thick and thin in a lot of areas, but what makes, what makes you tick? What makes Tom Steve tick today? Like what gets you out of bed in the morning and say to yourself, you know, that was a good day of work yesterday. We did some good work here and, and let's do it again today. What, what drives you at this point? Um, I think it's mostly um, <clears throat> how we, and I mean, this will sound like a, cliche, but uh, how we can best serve farmers. Um, I've been working in this space for quite a few years. And uh, when we can accomplish uh, even small victories on behalf of farmers in, in the policy realm or, or whatever it is, uh, a few years ago, the federal government um, wanted to do away with uh, uh, deferred cash tickets which was just a red flag. And um, we actually uh, beat the Department of Finance on that one. Uh, they just, um, they didn't realize the implications of uh, doing away with that tool. And um, so I, I think it's, um, <clears throat> you know, I still like to get up in the morning and uh, think that we can make a difference for the farmers that we serve. And that probably the second part of it is, is because I'm getting you know, a bit uh, more advanced in my career <clears throat> is helping my uh, my younger colleagues, many of whom are half my age, uh, succeed in their careers. And I think we've we've made some headway there too, um, in terms of giving people an opportunity to um, to build a reputation in the industry. It's a very small community, as you know, um, but um, we've we've really gone out of our way to try to find. Uh, good opportunities for our people. You know, what's, as you mentioned that, I, I was thinking that's a, out of, out of good leaders, I've often heard that is that they enjoy that mentorship aspect. Is that something that's, you know, recently started? Or I, I don't, I feel like it's probably something that you've been doing, you know, had folks under your wing for a long time. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, <clears throat> yeah, excuse me. You, uh, during the course of your career, there's a balance between um, what's, good for me and what's good for the people that work for me um you know you're because you're trying to build your own career um but i was just actually reminded of that the other day by a couple of guys that worked for me in radio about 30 years ago and they said you know you're a pretty good boss and and um you know they um were able to pick up something along the way so um but but there's no magic formula uh, honestly, I think that uh, definitely as you get older that you're, you're looking to leave a, a bit of a legacy. And so maybe I'm in that mode more so than I was 15 years ago or even 10 years ago. When I was working for Viterra, I was really looking to, um, to move up in the, in the company, uh, which was a very large organization at the time. And... Um, so maybe more emphasis on my own career than on the career of others uh, at that point. Well, I guess you are in a, a luxurious position now. And as you said, you know, you mentioned the word legacy here. And I know you're, I want you to stick around for, for many more years. I know you got a few more in you, so I don't think you're leaving yet. But when you do think back, what, what, would, what would be a couple of the accomplishments you're, you're pretty proud of over the years? Well, I think um, actually... Um, I was involved in a few uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, one, when United Grain Growers and uh, Agricor merged, and it was really a takeover by U UGG. And um, you know, we convinced uh, farmers that that was a good idea. Um, and then the the next one was uh, the SAS Wheat Pool takeover of. Uh, Agricore United probably wasn't, didn't go maybe the way that I thought it would because I was working for Agricore United <clears throat> and um, we were taken over by SAS Wheat Pool. But in the end, um, it turned out well. And then we went on after that, uh, which I, th I think is one of the things that I'm most proud of in my career is we acquired ABB Grain in Australia. Ooh. And uh, <clears throat> we did a whole series of farmer meetings across South Australia to uh, sell them on the idea of uh, selling their company to these Canadians. 
and um, they they embraced it, and and we found a lot of common ground with them. And um, so I I think the the acquisition of um, ABB Grain was one that um, I'm quite proud of, and I've still got a few of the mementos from that time. That was 2009. So I got a couple of questions out of that. One, <clears throat> I've heard that you've had a nickname and it involves the closure of grain elevators. Is there any truth to this or what's the backstory on this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, um, so in the late 90s and early 2000s, we were um, basically transforming the grain handling system in Western Canada, moving from you know wooden elevators every seven miles or 10 miles to uh, a network of high throughput facilities. And it was a <clears throat> it was a wrenching time for many communities because they were losing the uh, majority of their tax base for one thing. Uh, if they had a pool and a UGG or a pioneer and a, and a mm -hmm. pool, um, you know, <clears throat> that, that could be the majority of the, the tax base of the town or Hamlet or whatever. And, um, but it was a necessary uh, step in the process. And uh, so, yeah, we, um, sometimes we weren't too popular with the, the farmers, but most of them are still talking to me today, even uh, all these years later, because in the end, the farms were growing faster than the grain handling system uh, was growing to be able to uh, accommodate their needs. So, you know, I think, I don't know the exact progression, but I'm pretty sure the semis and the super bees started uh, being bought by farmers before um, we got <clears throat> to the high throughput system. Uh, because the farms were getting bigger out of necessity, right? Um, uh, economies of scale being what they are. So today it seems like um, that was a natural, pretty natural progression. Could we have saved some of those uh, smaller facilities for specialty houses? Probably could have. Um, some were, I think, unfortunately demolished for maybe purely commercial reasons. They didn't want the farmers to be uh, using those facilities against them. But uh, for the most part, it, I mean, we uh, we came out of that process with a few bruises, but uh, but it was uh, a necessary step. So when you think back, do you have any regrets <clears throat> that maybe about different situations? And by regrets, I mean, maybe issues that <clears throat> went sideways on you or there was a goal and we just, you know, collectively weren't able to push across the finish line. Kind of anything that we... We look back on and wish wish things were different. Um, I I think that um, and most of my colleagues uh, would from Viterra days would agree that uh, we were on a path to become a global Canadian publicly traded agribusiness, and um, it was somewhat derailed by uh, Glencore acquiring our company, and in two thousand and thirteen, I guess that deal closed. At one time, uh, farmers either through the prairie wheat pools or United Grain Growers controlled a significant uh, proportion of not only the grain handling industry, but uh, the fertilizer manufacturing sector, um, the crop input uh, retail network, which is now um, controlled by Nutrien. And, um, you know, it, it's uh, I think that we all felt that, um, or a lot of us felt that we we could have become that global powerhouse, Canadian publicly traded agribusiness. Um, and, you know, we were uh, establishing an office in a presence in Calgary and um, satellite offices in Regina and Adelaide, South Australia. And, you know, then there was talk of, a major acquisition in the U.S. and that um, that ended, but that's how the market works, right? Uh, uh, Glencore came along, saw an opportunity, and uh, it was uh, that was the end of that. And now, I mean, Viterra is still a great company. Uh, don't get me wrong; based in Regina, and many of my friends still work there, but it is uh, primarily a, a grain handling company, and we were. Um, 
on a path to be sort of the full service. You know, you can buy your bins from us, your, your fertilizer, your crop protection products, and so on. Yeah. We still have, you know, Richardson is a, a major force in the industry and, uh, and um, companies like Parrish and Heimbecker, which have grown, actually. But I, if I had a regret, it would be that um, we didn't quite realize our goal with Viterra. It's very interesting. It's a shame. I, 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 I empathize with that one. Hey, yeah. let me ask you this. I love your, your kind of wry sense of humor. Who's the funniest guy or gal that you've dealt with over the years in the ag world that might be a notable name to folks? Well, that would be Senator Gary Stanford, like hands down. Or, of, course. So, <laughs> of course. Former president of Grain Growers of Canada. So, <laughs> and, and for those of you that may not know, he's not actually currently a senator yet. No, no, but he could <laughs> well, be. Yeah. Hey, I think there's some vacancies. Maybe maybe his name is on the, on, on the pile somewhere on the dock. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, Gary served as... Uh, uh, well, on the board from the time I started here until a couple of years ago, he was finally uh, board chair at the end, mm -hmm. and we're we're good friends. I I jokingly refer to him as my older brother because he actually is six years old or six months older than me. So uh, so there you go. But, you better uh, be careful on those years versus months slip ups. So yeah, yeah, up it's it's there. it's months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one more question before I, I we get to another beer here. What would you give somebody like me or somebody, some other young uh, man or woman working in this sector or any sector for that matter? What's a piece of advice you'd give somebody that they could just kind of chew on? Um, I don't know. I'm not very good at that kind of thing, but uh, I, I think it's, um, you know, you, you really got to pick your spots and, and um, when an opportunity arises, jump on it. Um, but don't be discouraged if those opportunities don't come your way just when you might expect them to. In my case, I, like I, you know, I got into um, the political world in my, you know, kind of late twenties, uh, which a lot of ministerial assistance and so on, that's a typical path. And then, um, you know, that particular government was defeated. So then, what am I going to do next? And you, you kind of, sometimes uh, you have to hit a few uh, dry holes to use a, an oil and gas term before your uh, full potential can be realized. And I, I definitely experienced uh, a period in my career where, you know, maybe I wondered if I was ever going to make it uh, into, you know, what I thought would be my career goal. Um, but so, you know, sometimes your career is like a game of snakes and ladders. It goes up and down, but don't get discouraged if, it, uh, if there's some, uh, uh, especially if you're involved in politics, it can be very volatile, as you know. Yes. Yeah, we, uh, 2015, I was out of a job and I was very fortunate. And, and, you know, you kind of mentioned that when I ended up working for Sopak, that put me on a path to agriculture. You know, yeah, that's, yeah. that's really what started me thinking and that this is kind of the area and it wouldn't have happened without that. So yes, there's ups and downs. I think that's, uh, it's a very, pe very sage piece of advice, Tom. And I, I yeah. know folks will appreciate that. Yeah, well, yeah. let's go to our, our third sample here. This one I I'm quite intrigued by. This is the village father, the juicy Abigarden new England IPA. Now I am very interested, Tom, you go ahead here. I'm just going to read some of these notes out for folks here. So this is a brand, a fairly new, new product of June 2021, and it's a true to style New England IPA with tropical citrus hops and a unique, unique juicy Ebba Garden Quebec yeast. This is a bit, bit of a complex hazy beer that will hit the spot for craft beer explorers looking for exotic hop adventures. Have you been on an exotic hop adventure, Tom, while sipping? Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around this one actually right now. I, I, uh, I'm an IPA guy. So this is, this is up my alley. I like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very citrusy. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good flavor. It, um, so. It's a, it's a course, 7 of course, there, of course there's weed in it. That, <laughs> I, I knew it. 
You got that. Your palate is that good, eh? Even <laughs> well, with a blended you, product you of barley of, and wheat, eh? You, you can kind of, uh, a wheat beer, you can sort of sense a mile away, and but this isn't quite as um, as wheaty as some, but definitely there's wheat in this. If I think if you like a, if you like a nice juicy IPA, you'll like that. That's yeah, yeah. That's really cool. So, nope. Tom, can I ask you a couple of big picture questions here, maybe? So, when you think about the future of farming, what do you what do you kind of fear most, or what do you think are the biggest potential risks for our sector here in Canada? Um, uh, trade and carbon pricing. <laughs> Would be right at the top of the list, obviously, and our you know our farms are increasing in size just uh, because of the economies of scale um, situation, and then the risk, you know, and what we've just experienced with this uh, week and a bit heat wave, you know, a crop can go down the tubes uh, very fast, and if you're farming 10, 15, 20,000 acres in the same geography, um, there's a tremendous amount of risk there. Uh, I, I noticed that uh, the uh, parliamentary um, budget officer just said that uh, carbon levy would have a minimal impact on agriculture. And I, I just don't believe that <laughs> because it's embedded in the cost of absolutely everything. And, yep. and that's, that's the, to me, if I was farming and I kind of w wished I was farming now, even though I didn't want to be in farming before, but um, just the, how much $170 a ton carbon tax is going to put a, a stranglehold on our industry. Um, and if our competitors don't embrace a similar price on carbon, we're, we're out of business. And that, that's a big concern to me. And I think that, um, you know, I'm not sure that our uh, federal and provincial governments all are willing to chip in on um, meaningful risk management programs um, to the extent that they're needed. That's, that's going to be one that will play out in the coming years. But I feel like, especially in um, with a government that is dominated in central Canada, they don't realize the scale of agriculture in the West and the, um, and the risk that farmers are taking and the risk of trade agreements going south. I'm, I was pardoned that that uh, supply management bill didn't go, go through before Parliament rose, <laughs> because that one was, was uh, would have been pretty dangerous uh, to our our trading um, situation. Bad so, legislation. And for those yeah. that might not be following Parliament as close as Tom and I, it's a bill that would disallow uh, trade negotiators from even considering any of the supply managed sectors when negotiating new or renegotiating existing free trade agreements. It, it was a handcuff yeah. mechanism that. Uh, Thankfully, although Parliament, there may not be an election, a Parliament may come back, so it's not dead in the water yet. <laughs> but I was happy to see that they didn't rush it through, and instead we yeah. got, you know, Larry McGuire's uh, bill on secession planning that is is much more useful to farmers. But it's interesting you mentioned that about the carbon taxes and and the PBO reports. It's it's like they just don't believe us. You know, it's yeah. it's it's very clear what these costs are. Everybody says the same thing, and yet I get that the math is difficult, but that's not good enough. You you can't just steamroll an industry like this yeah but yeah. say la vie well who knows there'll be an election and 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 all sorts of things could be changing here but you know i guess i'll just ask on the flip side of instead of the negative what's what's the positive you know i think there's tremendous opportunity i know you agree with that where do you where do you see our sector going where's that growth potential really lie um i think there's going to be in spite of the fact that we're um our industry is built largely for bulk handling, at least in wheat and canola and barley, maybe not so much pulses because it's more containerized shipping. But I think there's going to be more specialization and segmented markets. Um, 
and that will be an opportunity. Uh, consumers want more choice, and um, we just have to find a way to to satisfy that. Um, it's it's not going to be good enough to just ship wheat in 100 and 150 car trains. Um, we we do have to find a way to uh, segment those products, and you know who knows what's going to happen with canola and this uh, renewable um, biofuel uh, craze. You know, uh, Saskatchewan would potentially have more uh, crushing capacity than there are acres in Western Canada. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm not sure all of those plants will be built, but it is an opportunity. And, uh, you know, we were talking about um, ethanol and biodiesel in the early 2000s when grain prices were really low. And now there's a renewed interest in, um, in, um, in those products. Um, I, I'm still a little bit of a skeptic in, into what the take up is going to be, but any market is, uh, and provided that it's not heavily subsidized, it's a positive. <laughs> and um, therein lies the issue. But I, I think for um, Canadian grains and oil seeds, um, there's a lot of upside potential. And I, I do think that the markets are going to become more specialized. So you're, you're going to find markets in California for certain specs of wheat that um, that don't just all move in uh, those unit trains, and and uh, with uh, CN and Kansas City Southern uh, amalgamating potentially, um, there's going to be better access by rail to those markets too. Excellent points. The potential is there. Yeah. Now, I, I got to go back to something you said earlier because I kind of glossed over it, but I think there's got to be a story here. Are you currently in a rock band still, or was that just a high school phase, or what's going on? Are you still playing something? No, no, I uh, I don't even own a set of drums anymore, but I do have a guitar. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I I I flushed that out of my system, but okay, I, I did play. Uh, I played in a, a few country bands over the years because I worked in country radio in Regina, and. Um, you know, so we, we did that, but that's a long time ago. And uh, so, yeah, I'm not planning uh, a foray back into music <laughs> anytime any soon. But my, um, our, our son is a, he's a pretty good guitar player and plays piano. And our grandson, who's seven, is, uh, is I think, going to be a budding guitarist. So we'll see, maybe we'll get the band together, you know. I'll have to get a, a set of drums, though. So. Well, I think that's a good idea. The the rhythm must stay in your family because I evidently didn't have enough. I was playing tuba only, and I could barely figure that out. So, I <laughs> kudos to your family for uh, for being. I I started out playing the saxophone actually, and then uh, you look I, like a smooth jazz guy. Then I decided I wanted to be a rock musician, so I I traded in my saxophone for uh, I think a part of a drum kit. So. <laughs> And now you're here and you're going to have to get it back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let me let me ask you a, a, a general question about Alberta. What's going on politically in Alberta right now? What 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 I'm seeing polls that I am quite surprised by. Uh, is it all pandemic handling related or is it just the, the wide divergence of two ideologies and the pandemic handling or what's going on in Alberta? Um, well, I think some of it is uh, pandemic related, but that's. Uh, probably all provincial governments are going to be judged, you know, for you should have done this, you should have done that. Um, I think that uh, in rural Alberta, there's a level of discontent that, uh, oh, the tax burden is being disproportionately uh, shifted to, uh, to rural people. Uh, the oil industry, of course, has, you know, um, in decline and there's a lot of orphaned wells that are uh, taxes are not being paid on and I think farmers generally are frustrated with that um, but th those people are going to vote conservative in the end I think um, 
the worrisome trend if you're a uh, supporter of the UCP is in Calgary um, because it's a it's a very diverse uh, city and um, you know it, as Calgary goes I think so goes Alberta Edmonton is going to you know tend to vote for the left and uh, Calgary will be once again the, the battleground in my opinion mm. and Right now, it's not looking real good for the UCP, but uh, as things open up, uh, people get more optimistic and for, kind of for, you know, um, <clears throat> six months in a in <laughs> politics is an eternity, right? <clears throat> and um, so, if we have a good summer and things open up, um, but we still have a fundamental disconnect in our petroleum industry and. Um, uh, it doesn't seem like that's going to be solved anytime soon, except uh, that there's pretty strong demand for oil right now. I mean, prices are up, so let's hope yeah. for the best. The sector yeah. needs it, the province needs it. Yeah. Maybe sticking with, with Alberta, and some of the listeners probably, or they may or may not know, um, but I wonder if you can get an update on the progress of the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission amalgamation process and kind of where that's at and you know how things are unfolding right now. Yeah, well, um, within the next day, we're going to be launching a consultation process with uh, wheat and barley farmers just to gauge their views on uh, a formal amalgam amalgamation. Uh, we've been integrated under one management team actually since the fall of 2017. Mm. Um, and then we formalized it in the summer of 2018. But we're still serving two separate boards. <clears throat> so we have got two, two different governance structures, two financial structures, two of everything. And um, so it, there's a lot of overlap and um, duplication of effort. And um, you know, we think, and our amalgamation subcommittee thinks that there's a good argument to merge the organizations formally. And we've seen that in Manitoba uh, with the Manitoba Prop Alliance. Uh, grain farmers of Ontario and, and PGQ in Quebec have been uh, multiple uh, commodity organizations forever. <clears throat> so it's it's not a new idea, but um, there's a lot of issues that uh, we have to work through. And and um, I guess what we think we have going for us is that we've proven that the management model works well, has saved us money. And so it's a better deal for the farmers overall. Um, it's, I think when you get down to the finer detail though, it's, um, there's two different uh, marketing systems. Uh, you know, barley goes into feed and malt and wheat goes into bread and, and um, pasta and so on. So um, we, we just have to work through that and convince farmers that it's uh, that it's to their advantage. And we're trying not to be too prescriptive in saying you should be in favor of it. We're trying to consult with them on whether they should support it. Um, but we do have a pretty good track record, I think. And uh, it just makes sense, um, you know, for cereal crops of that are have pretty similar agronomic issues uh, that we could be working together. And, and that's what we've been doing. So in your mind, is that kind of that important threshold? I mean, obviously we're seeing a trend, you mentioned MCA in Manitoba and some of these other groups that this is happening. And, and, you know, I think it's, it's widely supported. I'm curious, is that the, the best way to identify of, of similar cereal type crops or similar pulses as, as kind of the unifier and, and could that pendulum swing too far? Or, or is this just an, an important way to, to kind of tighten up the operations of, of industry groups? I don't know. I, I think it's just, uh, you know, with, if within the pulse groups, you don't have uh, the uh, the pea commission and the lentil commission and the faba bean commission. You know, you have pulses all under one banner. And same with, with wheat. We don't have a separate Durham commission. And... Um, but in Saskatchewan, they still have a separate winter wheat commission, uh, and um, Manitoba, you know, folded winter wheat into uh, 
Manitoba Crop Alliance. So, you know, there's, um, again, some of it is old conventional thinking and um, convincing people that there's more value and that's our job. So we'll take that on. I know you're up to the task. <laughs> so maybe what we can do here is uh, we'll sample our, our fourth beer from Village and then I think I'll have one more question for you. Uh, so this one is the uh, Village Nomad. The, this is the, the normal uh, IPA. Uh, I assume you, I have a feeling you might have had this one already before, but I haven't, so I'm excited to give it a shot. Why don't you uh, pour yourself a glass there, Tom? So this is the Village Nomad, uh, is the brewery's full-time hazy IPA. Uh, the malt bill for the Nomad is clean and simple. We don't want to tread on the hops. Uh, the hops are an all-star lineup, Galaxy, Mosaic, and Citra. The boil has no hops additions, and the Whirlpool is Galaxy and Mosaic. Well, all three are added for the dry hopping. Village didn't want to leave anything to chance. So they're producing this with reverse osmosis water. As such, they can build, our, build their own water profile, which aims to push the hops forward and not interfere with any of the harsh mineral flavors. The final, final character in the story is the yeast, Escarpment's Foggy London Ale. When fermented a touch higher than usual, they can, they can get a nice fruity ester formation. The Nomad is not light-bodied and the sessionable ale, a beer for all, but it packs a hoppy flavor and bitterness that you would expect from a hazy IPA. Is that accurate to you, Tom? Yeah, <clears throat> well, that's probably more information that I required. Well, now you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so th this really strikes me as a the type of IPA that I would normally consume, yeah. and uh, it's very well done. <sighs> yeah, we can agree. We can agree on that one. All right, Tom, maybe I got uh, one final ag-related question. Um, there are some significant changes happening with respect to how research is undertaken in Alberta. And I know you were a founding vice chair of the Results Driven Agricultural Research, uh, a new not-for-profit research company in Alberta. Can you tell us kind of the background of how this came about, what these changes will look like, and what your hope is for the future of the organization? Yeah, sure. Um, under the previous NDP government, uh, we were, um, I think all of the crop and livestock commissions were frustrated at the direction that research funding was going because the government was moving towards uh, policy-based research as opposed to productivity-based research. We objected to that and, and I think we, I like to think that we had a fair bit of influence in the UCP platform uh, going into the election that they would turn that those decisions back to the farmers. So um, I was asked to serve on the interim board of results driven agriculture by Minister Grecian. And a number of us um, were tagged with that. I, that would have been a year ago in April that we started. And we built this not for profit company from the ground up. Um, Alberta Barley Commission actually administered the original CAP grant. Uh, my uh, chief operating officer, Saida Karam, administered it. Uh, we So we stepped up and said, we'll help this company get off the ground. And um, we, I don't know how many, I lost count of how many board meetings we had over the course of the first year of operation, but it was uh, a group that really came together and wanted to create something new. The government um, of Alberta, the, the Ag Ministry, decided to exit from a number of um, areas of research. And uh, people were ouchy about that too, but um, in reality, the Alberta government was the only provincial Ag Ministry in Canada that had internal scientific capability. Uh, so actually, scientists doing research. So um, that uh, has all changed now. And um, it's about $37 million a year that RDAR has access to, to fund research. And we've found as commissions, uh, and I can speak for Alberta Wheat and Barley Commissions, um, there's a lot more transparency in what uh, is being funded. 
Uh, we had a really hard time when we were dealing with the bureaucracy to get a straight answer on how much money was in the pot, where it was going, what the priorities were. Uh, so it's been highly successful in my opinion. I did not run for the permanent board um, just for time management reasons, but um, we have uh, some really great directors on, on the board, uh, majority of whom are farmers. And um, my director of research, uh, Dr. Lauren Common is uh, co-chair of the advisory committee. So we have a lot of voices around the table. Um, and um, I think what, what we felt is just a change in tone. And um, research is incredibly important if we're gonna be competitive long-term. And um, we were having a hard time figuring out what the research priorities were under the previous government. Um, they were more focused on political objectives than economic objectives in our opinion. So. Well, you, you may well just be a pioneer in this. I mean, I think a lot of other folks are looking to see what this change will look like and how it may apply to them because I suspect you know, your concerns with the existing model probably weren't unique to Alberta. Uh, so I know a lot of other folks are going to be interested in that. So, so keep us posted on that. We will. Now, I understand that you've actually received an extra beer that I didn't get because it's so new that it launched today, but you've had it delivered to you today. And I want to give uh, Village the opportunity for, for folks to have a, a listen at, at Tom Steve's first taste. Of, of what I gather to be a fairly iconic beer uh, in Alberta's past uh, yeah. that is uh, called the Calgary Craft Beer Lager. And so yeah. Village has yeah. collaborated with Molson and Six Pints to reimagine and reinterpret a version of the original Calgary beer. And so this, this craft lager is going to be available in four different and creative cans sold as a four pack this yeah. summer. Uh, and so I think you've got, you've got a sample version here. First first uh first batch i think so interprovincial trade barriers didn't let that get to me in time but i want to hear what <laughs> what your take is on it and then i'm gonna to have to ask the important question of of what's your favorite of, of the five uh, you're gonna taste uh village brewery uh, products are so you go yeah. ahead i want to hear some quick feedback because i'm looking forward to going to stampede and trying this myself yeah well the first thing i want, wanted to say is that you know i'm I'm pretty familiar with Calgary beer. I think I used to drink it out of stubby bottles back in the <laughs> seventies, along with uh, Pilsner and Bohemian out of Saskatchewan. But uh, the, the Calgary brewery was an iconic place. I think it ended up um, maybe towards the end of its tenure as a Carling O'Keefe brewery. But um, the, yeah, I, I was pretty impressed with uh, the branding on it. Now we'll see what it tastes like. <laughs> <laughs> I think if uh, our previous samples are any indication, it's going to be good. Yeah. Yeah. You, does it taste like you're at 20 again? <laughs> yeah, that, that would be hard. Um, yeah, like it, it, it's a it's a traditional lager. And, yeah. um, you know, you're uh, unlike some of these other beers, uh, you're not you're not going to drink like six uh, of some of those IPAs. We would but never you, do that, you might, would we? You might drink a little bit more of, uh, of the Calgary Lager. Yeah, it's a very smooth taste. Yeah, excellent. Well, I I look forward to uh, to getting out to uh, to Calgary to uh, to try it myself. But so out of the five you sampled, you have to pick one from the fine ales from uh, the Village Brewery. What's your favorite? Um, well, I think I'm going to have to go with the Nomad. Uh, I really like that one. And I love the logo on it too. And the, and the image of the guy and the dog walking stick. So I think I'm going to go with the, uh, New England IPA. I, that's a very, that's a flavorful, uh, yeah. birth. Uh, I, I quite enjoyed that one, but, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tom for, for coming and spending some time with us and enjoying some beers and thank you to beer Canada, our presenting sponsor, uh, for this summer series podcast. And of course, thanks to the village brewery for, uh, providing us some, 
some excellent beer, uh, excellent products here for us to try. And, and most importantly, thanks to you all for listening. We'll be back next week with another special guest that I think you will know and you will find interesting. And in the meantime, if you want to stay up to date with all things Grain Growers of Canada, please follow us on Twitter at Grain Growers or on Instagram at Canada's Grain Growers. Until next time, get out there and explore more products available from Village Brewery and enjoy some high quality grains in Canada's favorite summertime drink. Take care.